Hey there, welcome to another episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and this week's vlog is a very special one because in this week's episode I'm going to show you the interview that I did with Fab Morven of Milli Vanilli. Enjoy! Milli Vanilli was a vocal pop R&B group formed in 1988 by Frank Farian. Frank Farian is a German producer and songwriter who became famous as the founder and producer of disco pop group Boney M, which he formed in the 1970s. In 1988, Frank started a new project, which became Milli Vanilli. The members of the band were Fab Morven and Rob Pilatus, two friends who did spend their time together with model work, breakdancing and singing. Their first release as Milli Vanilli was Girl You Know It's True, which came out on June 25, 1988. It became a number one in the German charts, number two in the United States and number three in the United Kingdom. Furthermore, it became a top 10 hit in many other countries all around the world. Later singles such as Baby Don't Forget My Number, Girl I'm Gonna Miss You, All or Nothing, Blame It On The Rain and Keep On Running became big hits as well. Rob and Fab toured around the world and Milli Vanilli became one of the most popular acts in the late 1980s and early 90s. And they sold millions of records and albums worldwide. Milli Vanilli won a Grammy Award for Best New Artist in February 1990 for their album Girl You Know It's True. But later the band got involved in one of the largest scandals in the history of pop music, when the world found out that Rob and Fab didn't sing on any of the Milli Vanilli recordings. Rob and Fab always said that they have been tricked by Frank Farian, who recruited them just for their looks and dancing skills. Despite a lot of promises of Farian, Rob and Fab never were given a chance to actually record a song for the project. Later Frank Farian started The Real Milli Vanilli with Brad Howell and John Davis, the actual singers of Milli Vanilli. But the success of The Real Milli Vanilli didn't came anywhere near to the massive success of the actual Milli Vanilli with Rob and Fab. Rob Pilatus was found dead in a hotel in Frankfurt, Germany on April 2, 1998. It was on the eve of a promotional tour for a brand new Milli Vanilli album called Back and In Attack. The album was produced by Frank Farian and featured Rob and Fab on lead vocals. Because of the death of Rob Pilatus, the Back and In Attack album never got released. Rob Pilatus was only 32 years old. Recently I had the honor to speak to Fab Morven and talk to him about Milli Vanilli, the true story about the scandal and the lip syncing, his current career in music and of course his future plans. This year it is 30 years ago since Girl You Know It's True came out. A lot of things did happen in the 30 years after the release of this track. I think it's safe to say that this track really changed your life. I say so, it changed my whole life. I mean it was like, I believe the Girl You Know It's True was like a domino effect. You know, when that track came out it was like point of no return but i didn't know what i was venturing into i had no idea i wasn't aware about the industry the inner working of the industry the power that a person can have over you once you signed a contract once you receive money that exchange of money i had no clue we had no clue so we're totally blind and innocent and naive to this whole thing. So the only thing we had was the youth, the drive, the talent to perform, to sing, which we thought we were going to do, but it didn't happen. But the reason why they came to us in the first is because they saw us perform with a full band, with studio musicians who were working with Frank Farian. And that's how we were discovered. So the performing part and singing part was, okay, we, we passed the test. That's the reason why we thought Frank Farian wanted to work with us. Mm -hmm. That's how it's all kind of started. Let's start at the beginning. Milli Vanilli was a project between you and Rob Pilatus. How did you and Rob meet? Um, Rob and I met in, uh, in Munich, Germany. Just, you know, frequenting the same places, same clubs dating the same girls <laughs> and then after a while you know you, you think well if you can't beat him join him and then by joining forces we 
we came stronger and um, music is what we wanted to do. We had the same dreams when it came to music and our career and our lives and aspiration and how we wanted to live our lives and we love sport. So it was playing soccer in the afternoon and music whole day. He played guitar, I sang. We sang together, we did harmonies. He used to play guitar because he used to, um, to sing. His sister used to be a Elvis impersonator. So he, he knew all the, a lot of Elvis songs. So he would play some of them as well. And then as a result, we would jam out and then write songs as well. Write some blues, blues song, three chords, that's all you need to write a song. And we were very much into Prince, you know, Prince under the Time album at the time. And uh, trying to, to sing those songs as well and, and just vibe enough different artists that were there during that time. But Prince was definitely one of our favorites. I'm not sure if many people know this, but Girl You Know It's True is actually a cover from the group Newmarks. Did you know this version yourself before? Yeah, yeah, I knew that Newmark, I knew Newmark was a cover. I found that out a lot later. At first I didn't know it because I didn't know exactly what was going on in the studio with Frank Farin because they had that like on lockdown. You know, we came in afterwards not knowing that everything was, that part was already moving on its own with staff and producers and people recording. As a matter of fact, some of the people that recorded their vocals to the uh, Girl Know It's True were recording by themselves. And then another guy would come in and say, but I know that voice. It, and, you know, Frank would be like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Just and, But they thought that it was, was going to be a project that they would be part of in the future. But it didn't turn out to be that, you know. So they were tricked as well? Oh, yeah, everybody was tricked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've... I've told the story many times, but because I've been working with John Davis, one of the original vocalists of Nivinelli, we do shows in Germany. We've been touring in, in Germany and in the Eastern Bloc, and he tells me stories sometimes, and sometimes he helps me tie in together, like what happened, and that's one of those. Like, he was strict as well. He thought he was gonna be part of that project. He had no idea that it was just like, hey, this is for hire. That was uh, discussed later. So, how did it work? Frank finished the song and then he showed it to you guys? No, no, no. First we heard uh, an instrumental and uh, we thought we were going to be part of that. But it was not the case. And because we received advanced money, very little amount of money, when the time came for us to want to record those songs and they said no, and we said no then, and then they said, well, give us the money back. And we said, oh, oh, we can't pay you back. Okay, so what do we do? Well. We work, we pay you back, and then we get out. But we didn't know that we, paid a, we, we signed a contract for three albums. Because when we signed the contract, there was no attorney, there was no manager, there was nobody that was there to protect us. So when, if we had a management and attorney, they would have said, no, 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 no. Okay, let them sing. First, give them a chance, because he never gives give us a chance. Give them the chance. And if they don't, then they'll pay you back the money and then they get out. But it was not like that. We got the money, we signed the contract, no protection, naive, trusting the big guy with all the gold records on the wall. And that's it. That's all she wrote. So, many people ask why you guys did not tell the press back then what was really going on. Oh, <laughs> you know, once you get a taste of that life, you know, it's hard to go back because you come from nothing. And you really hope that you, at some point, they're gonna let you sing. But I was also very naive from us, like, ugh. It would, you know, we thought it was gonna happen, second single, third single. But you know, you got that life. You know, it's not the, you're, you're, you know, you're not actually living your dream, you're partly living your dream. And that part of performing and connecting with the fans and traveling, this new life, it was hard to say no to that, but in the end, we're the one who, who actually forced the whole breakup of that whole thing, because we were tired of it, and we said, okay, that's it, we're gonna push him, and in the end, he 
went to New York and told the world, oh, they didn't sing on a record. When in fact, we pushed him to do that because we were done. We, we didn't want to go on a second, do a second record. No way. It must have been quite scary to go on stage each time, especially with live television. No, because in Europe, everything was playback. You know, for years, Europe, a lot of even American acts who came to Europe, none of the studios were built for live performances. So it was playback. You know, until in Europe, it was normal for people. And I found out later that a lot of, during the 80s, a lot of, um, because you know, this generation from back in the days didn't have YouTube. Because of today, speak much better English than the people from yesterday. The world has changed. So back then, they used to have European people and then have Americans record. A lot of European producers did that. I didn't know that. I found out that, oh, there was not, it didn't happen to us, but you know, with us, it was not willing, but there was some, some plans where there were teams that were saying, okay, I pay you this amount of money, blah, blah, blah. You know, but we, you know, we became very successful, not knowing that it would ever go like that. We thought, okay, we do one record, we pay the money back, and then we're out. But then success, success came and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Were you scared or did you feel very relieved when the world found out that the two of you were not singing on any of the Milli Vanilli tracks? Ah, uh, we were. You know, it was, it was uh, sad, uh, relieved, it was a mix, mixed emotions because, you know, now the truth is out, the weight was gone, but now you had this new life and this new life wasn't going to be pretty. We didn't know what was going to happen next because, you know, you went, you were celebrated, people loved you and suddenly, oh, they didn't sing a record, so then, it's, uh, it was disappointing for some fans, but our life changed after that, yeah, drastically. You know, if I could ever change one thing and go back in time, of course, singing on a record and, and keeping uh, Rob Pilates alive. Yeah. Most people think you guys had to give back the Grammy Award you won in 1990 for Best New Artist. But this is not true. You actually gave it back yourself, right? That's right, it was, it's a misconception that it's very tough to change because back in the days there were only a few media outlets. There was no social media where you could speak you know, and tell your side of the story. So once one outlet came out with a story, everybody just you know, copy-pasted it and that was it. But the story was we wanted to give it back. We thought that we thought it was the right thing to do to give it back. But a journalist who came to interview us um, told them that we wanted to give it back and then they jumped the gun and they said, oh, we want it back. So, but in the end, the Grammy was out of my house, so they could have come to my house and get it. You know, <laughs> we gave it back willingly. What's the last time you spoke to Frank or you never spoke to him again at all? You know, listen, in regards to Frank, you know, you have to forgive. As hard as it may seem and was, I had to let that go because you can't hang on to, to anger because it, it, it will slow you down. As a human being, if you want to grow and evolve, you know, anger is, is, is a bad one. So just, I wiped the slate clean for myself so I could move on and grow and become the person that I always wanted to be. In all these years, I'm sure a lot of great and crazy things did happen while touring. What is the best memory you have from all these years? Uh, one of my favorites was uh, in Canada, we took a helicopter. The stage was here and we, take heli we, take, we took the helicopter and flew over the crowd. 65,000 landed behind the stage and ran straight straight and started the show that was a great memory there are rumors for a few years already that there will be a movie about the milli vanilli story is there any news about this yeah unfortunately you know we were supposed to start production in uh, in april in the month of april but 
because the producer Brett Ratner was brought up on sexual charges. It got stopped, you know, so now we're back to, it's sad, you know, because we were about finally going to go to production, but it's okay. You know, the saga continues. Um, we'll be talking to more people, you know, so I keep that on the, on the low low right now. I don't really give details, but it's all good. You know, my story is being written as we go every day. You performed as Face Meets Voice, Milli Vanilli Experience, together with John Davis, who is one of the original voices. Who came up with the idea for this? To perform together? Yeah. Uh, we both, you know, we met in Los Angeles and uh, someone flew us to Los Angeles to work on a project. And we met finally face to face and had dinner and hung out. And I was like, man, this dude is cool. And I said, well, if I go to, to Europe, you know, maybe we should connect. He was like, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I came to Holland and then uh, I, I gave him a buzz, say, yo, man, I'm here. He's like, oh, well, let's do something. I'm like, okay, let's try it. Let's try it out, you know, we're both musicians. So obviously performing together was the number one step. And then we also recorded music together and uh, we're still doing shows together. And as a matter of fact, booking more shows together. And I'm also working on, uh, I started last year. I played in Paradiso with a full band doing my songs, Million Lee songs and some covers. And now I got the footage for the club. I performed that for Freitag 2018 in the Nach this past weekend, about a couple of weeks ago. And um, it went very well. Now we got the, the outdoor footage and um, it's going out to promoters who were expecting footage because they were interested, but they wanted to see me on a, on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. So you can expect to see me uh, at a venue near you very soon around the world. So I'm very excited about that. You still travel the world to perform. So besides the live shows, are there also plans for new music? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I just built up, uh, just had a few meetings like uh, on my way back, I was in LA for about a month. And then I came back, I met with a group of people, publisher and label here, based here, but who work, they're kind of like a satellite, and they work with various major labels throughout the world. So we're putting a plan together. So definitely going back to become a, going back to, to I've always recorded, let's make that clear, I've always put music out on uh, underground label with, you know, up and coming DJ producers or underground producers, because I love, I'm into the dance music scene, been in the dance music scene for quite some time. I met you because of the DJ producer, you know, that's how we came in contact. So I've always been in it. I'm also DJing now. I've been DJing since 2010. And then uh, I did an article in the Parole magazine where I mentioned that I was DJing and then Heineken uh, got to me and said, hey, you want to play some corporate gigs? I was like, yeah, why not? And then I started playing for them and then from them I got more gigs and as a result I've been developing this this show. When I play corporate, I play, I play like, you know, when you play corporate shows it's more like house, commercial house, but my my love it goes to deep house, tech house, and I sing and spin at the same time. So I play in Asia, I do shows in Asia, I played a Medusa Festival in uh, Puebla, mm -hmm. Mexico, uh, this past uh, March. And I'll be doing some more in Latin America DJing as well and recording with DJ producers over there. So I don't stop, you know, but now it's time to take it to the next level and work with labels, with major labels again, going back to major labels and really working with professional teams. It's all about timing. So when you're DJing, is there like a separate alias that you have for it? Or do you DJ under your own name? Yeah, fair more, man. You know, I, I can't, you know, there are guys out there who've been DJing for 20 years. And they got all my respect. I can't say, oh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pure, you know, DJ, you know. So I just love the music. And because I was working with DJ producers, I felt like when I would do vocals for them, they would go to work and I'd be like, hmm. I like to go out there, you know, I like to get out there. And when Heineken came to me, I was like, okay, cool. So it, it gave me a chance to just play around. And as I went on and technology evolved, 
then I was able to like, okay, what do I really want to accomplish when I'm on stage DJing? You know, what do I want to do? And the one thing I, I really wanted to do was to connect with the audience because I, I'm, a, I'm a performer. Mm -hmm. I've always been that. So how do I get that same energy that I usually get from the live performance? Because, you know, sometimes DJing can be kind of like, okay, you get the screen, you head down, and it's, you know, that, that, that guy. I didn't want to be that guy. So, uh, I, and I remember playing in, in, uh, in Asia, between Malaysia and Indonesia, and I had shows like, it was like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then I had a day off, Saturday, and then Sunday I played. And I, I just realized, like, damn, man, I'm bored as hell. Because, you know, I had that one, I had like a few sets that I was bouncing back and forth. But I felt bored, like, just, okay, here we go, we mix now, drop, mm, 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 okay. Because when I, I, I was doing the, I was talking to the audience, but I felt like, I don't know, I have to really, I'm not feeling that. So then I said, you know what, let me, go more in depth into I want to feel something so I started going with controllers got with tractor you know and then suddenly with tractor and a controller I felt like okay now I can I can sample I can loop I can recreate a track I can fly vocals I can dub my vocals because you know technology allows us to like then I got a I got a F1 too and then I started, at home, I started experimenting. I was like, wow, I can see the, the possibility. How endless, and me being a singer, I was like, oh, that's cool. So I can, I can freestyle on the fly and be inspired. So just something fresh. So I can go from, from my DJ set into, you know, the F1. And then do like, you know, just, you know, freestyle. Okay, then okay, you know, you know, you know the drill. And then that inspired me, so I was like, okay, so that's what I've been working on. And I've been, tr I've tried it, you know, out on some of the shows and it felt great, you know. But I, you need to have, when you do that, you have to have the right kind of crowd, the crowd that knows that music. Especially when you do Deep House or Tech House, it has to be for the right crowd. But I get to play, you know, I play house, I love to play house, you know. But that's what I like to, I like to take people all the way up to the mountain. But they, when they know the music, it makes things a lot easier because they love, they're like purists, mm -hmm. you know, so when you talk their language, they're with you, you know, a nice groove, you know, then you drop it down, then the vocals come in, and it's not a record, it's me, I'm doing that live. So that's why, you know, playing live and DJing and singing at the same time just gave me give me the opportunity to experiment because as an artist you have to experiment you know if you stagnate that's why when I was just like okay I put my stick in and I'm like okay mix mix you know I don't want to do that I want to do I want to do that with my voice and move them and connect with them and then you create a whole type of a whole different thing you know regarding the dance world and dance music so I'm coming for y'all I also do a lot of dance records that I have because I also produce and I have some cool stuff prepared, but I'm not a, I can't say I'm a full on producer. I cannot finish the whole thing till the end. So I work with various producers who can finish my demos. So, but all in time, I'm not doing that right now because it's all about strategy and timing. You know, you, you have to, you have to time it right, otherwise, I don't want to confuse people. You know, that's why, you know, like I said, Fab More Van with the band, and then Fab More Van collaborating, and then from there, then we move on. But in the meantime, I'm going to play festivals, I'm going to play in clubs because people come to me. You know. Well, thank you very much for your time and good luck <laughs> in the future. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, that was it, my interview with Fab Morven of Millie Vanilli. Fab, thank you very much for your time. Much, much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>